Welcome back to our conference today. As a reminder, all conference materials are available for download at the bottom of the events page, and there's a link to that in the chat. The event is being recorded and will be available on the NWC YouTube page after the event. Welcome to our second panel on criminal activities in the maritime environment. The moderator for this panel is Admiral Guillermo Barrera. Admiral Guillermo Barrera has been a distinguished international fellow at the Naval War College since October 2011, where he teaches an elective in political warfare and supports a wide variety of programs across the Naval War College campus. His main assignments as flag officer were commander of the Colombian Navy, chief of operations of the Navy, commander Caribbean Naval Forces, and chief of integrated action at the joint command of the Colombian military forces. He had three command tours on Colombian ships. As operational commander and commander of the Navy during the, president, or the time of the government of President Alvaro Uribe, he was part of the government team that transformed Colombia from the brink of failure to stability and democracy. Admiral Barrera has a Bachelor of Science degree in elect Electrical Engineering and a Bachelor of Arts degree in Naval Sciences, both from the Colombian Naval Academy. He holds a Master of Science degree in Electrical Engineering from the U.S. Naval Postgraduate School. He also completed Naval Command College, class of 1993 at the Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island. Please join me in welcoming Admiral Barrera to lead our second panel today. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Commander. You are very kind with your presentation. I am honored to be the moderator of this panel in criminal activities in the um, maritime environment. We will focus on the four questions that were asked by Commander Cameron. So basically, framing the problem, determining what does it mean for a strategic environment, for navies, for Coast Guards, and uh, we will have one example of one country, what they are doing in her country to work on those areas. Then we will open the conversation for all participants in the Q&A period. Before we introduce our speakers, we want to provide some administrative guidance. First, all comments reflect the position of the speakers and attendees and do not necessarily reflect the official position of the U.S. Naval War College, the Department of the Navy, or the U.S. government. Please keep your microphones muted and cameras off. Please post all questions and comments in the chat for the question and answer period after the presentation. Now, let's begin. This panel has three great presenters. First, let me introduce Ms. Siri Biun, Deputy Head of the Uni United Nations Office on Drug and Crime, UNODC, Global Maritime Crime Program, GNPC, based on the Global Programs Headquarters in Colombo, Colombo, Sri Lanka. Her main responsibility areas are Program Strategy, Portfolio Development, and Program Visibility, as well as, the, as being the program gender focal point. In addition, CIRI has a specific focus on providing programming guidance and support to GNCP implementation in the Mediterranean, Southeast Asia, the Pacific Ocean, and West Africa, Gulf of Guinea. She is a Norwegian with a law degree from the University of Oslo. After university, City work with the Norwegian law enforcement for a year before moving abroad. She has been working as a trainee for the EFTA Surveillance Authority in Brussels and joined the UNODC headquarters in Vienna in 2007 as an associate expert within the UNODC's anti-corruption branch. In 2013, she joined the justice section in the Global Maritime Crime, Pro Crime Program. Before moving to Sri Lanka, she was based in Nigeria, where she was responsible for the program's implementation in the Gulf of Guinea and West Africa, with main focus on legal reform 
and capacity building in maritime law enforcement. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Siri Biun. Thank you very much for this opening, Admiral, and good evening from Sri Lanka. I'll wait for my presentation to be screen, please. Thank you. So first of all, I would like to thank the US Naval War College for inviting UNODC and the Global Maritime Crime Program to the conference and this panel discussion on criminal activities in the maritime environment. My part is intended as a scene setter to better understand the types of crimes we are confronted with and under which circumstances maritime law enforcement are operating. Let me start by saying that maritime space covers 70% of the earth and approximately 90% of the world's trade is carried out by sea. The maritime space is further recognized as the world's largest crime sea and illicit actors of all sorts use the maritime domain to pursue criminal profit, move goods and people illegally, dump waste and support networks that perpetrate transnational crime and terrorism. Next. This is the outline of my presentation. We're talking about different types of transnational organized crime occurring at sea. And we will have a look at some of them, though this is not an exhaustive list that will be presented. Further, I will look at the interconnectivity of several of the listed crimes and how these pose some challenges to the sea response, including jurisdiction and law enforcement powers. Also, there's value in looking at the broader picture of the criminal business and the organized element of it. Last, I would like to look at the comprehensive criminal justice response to the matter of criminal activities in the maritime environment. Next. As already mentioned, the list provided of types of criminal activities in the maritime environment is not exhaustive, but I'm mentioning those which fall under the area of GMCP's mandate and which I know will be further discussed in more detail and from different angles by my fellow panelists. Also, I will add a few emerging issues that are not on the slide, but worth mentioning. I've used some definitions and comments from our close partner on research, the Stable Seas, which was spoken uh, at the previous session, and their Maritime Security Index. Next, starting with terrorism at sea. Terrorism is one of the many forms of crime usually associated with land, but which also exist at sea. Terrorists target military and civilian vessels at sea and in port, but also make use of the sea as a means of transporting fighters and their weapons to the scene of their attacks. They also use proceeds from both legitimate and leg leg illegitimate trade to help fund their activities. Next, looking at illicit trafficking of nuclear materials. Spinning on the previous topic of terrorism, illicit trafficking of nuclear materials would include the protection against nuclear terrorism. Further, illicit trafficking of nuclear materials can lead to nuclear proliferation and the possible construction of improvised nuclear devices or radiological dispersal and exposure devices. Next, piracy. This is the initial crime that GMCP started looking at, and we're talking about the unlawful act of threat of violence, detention or theft for financial or material gain. Without going into further legal definition of piracy, this involves stealing a cargo and kidnapping a crew for ransom. And we have seen the massive impact piracy has on the shipping industry, global trade, as well as coastal states. We have experienced it in the Indian Ocean and we're still struggling with the crime in the Gulf of Guinea. Next. Firearms trafficking. Frequently traded illicit items such as arms are easily transported by sea as shipping containers are seldom inspected in port presenting a convenient and cost-effective mode of trans transport. And often seen in certain hotspots, often conflict-driven areas where the demand for weapons are high. The global flow of weapons to non-state actors with violent objectives fuels conflict in unstable regions in addition to illicit sale of legitimate products circumvent the formal economy by bypassing import and export regulations and undermine authorized dealers of such commodities. Next, crimes in the fishery sector. The issues of illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing is a massive problem as we will see in a separate panel discussion. Marine fisheries are essential for many coastal communities, whether that is for artisanal or small scale fishers, as well as large 
industrial fleets that make fisheries a critical contributor to national economies. The issue is not only IU fishing, but crimes associated with the fishery sector, where other crimes take place on a fishing vessel, such as drug trafficking and weapon smuggling, or crimes in the fisheries value chain, such as fraud, forgery, and corruption. Next, drug trafficking. The maritime routes are extensively used by traffickers of drugs, where there are limited chances of getting caught, and large consignments can be hidden in compartments, containers, and the likes, using pleasure craft, dows, and container ships. We see typical cocaine trafficking from South America, opiates trade in the Indian Ocean, and th synthetic drugs in Southeast Asia, just to mention a few. Drug trafficking has a broad economic cost, health implications, and impacts stability in countries and regions. Next. Human trafficking and smuggling of migrants. The trafficking in humans and irregular migration by sea often involves traversing open waters in unsafe and overcrowded vessels with untrained crew and with an immediate threat of capsizing and drowning. Law enforcement often end up in SAR operations while conducting law enforcement in trying to disrupt the criminal activity of smuggling. We see irregular migration as a hot topic in the Mediterranean, in Southeast Asia, and in Latin America. Next. Breach, my last one would be breaches to UN sanctions. So GMCP assists member states in sustainably deterring maritime trafficking in violation of UN Security Council sanctions regimes, including disruption of trade, illicit and illicit commodities in support of terrorist groups. Vessel movements are relevant to many UN Security Council sanction regimes, and so the success of sanction regimes imposed on Iran, Libya, Somalia, South Sudan, or Yemen heavily depends on the international community's capacity to monitor a vessel at sea through all available means. In addition to the crimes listed on the slide, I would like to add some emerging crimes which might be mentioned later. One is trafficking in minerals, which occurs as an evolving issue. Another matter is to expand the maritime environmental crime approach beyond fisheries crime to include tackling of marine pollution, as well as looking at the maritime security element in the blue economy. Next. We often don't see these listed crimes in silo or operating independently. There's often an interconnectivity between criminal activities, whether that is vessels involved in irregular migration, also trafficking drugs or weapons, or the use of fishing vessels in drug trafficking, as well as human trafficking in forced labor, in addition to terrorist groups getting involved in trafficking in illicit commodities to support their business. That brings me to the next point, which, which looks at the maritime law enforcement response which will vary and require different operational procedures depending on whether you are handling ir irregular migration or securing a crime scene where arms and weapons are being trafficked or IED components are on board. Further to this picture includes complex jurisdictional matters and several different legal frameworks will apply depending on which crime we are responding to and in which maritime zone the crime is occurring. The modus operandi might change according to where the criminal groups see benefit. This was illustrated the way piracy groups operated. In East Africa, the main target was kidnapping of the crew of ransom, often Western foreigners, which gave the highest profits. In West Africa, the groups mainly targeted oil transport or got involved in illegal oil bunkering. And the main value was the commodity. That later changed as oil prices went down and the groups saw more value in the kidnapping model. Despite the crimes occurring at sea, most of these crimes fall under an organized network which is managed on land. These are professional businesses fueling and facilitating the operations and profiting on the criminal activity. The criminal groups see where maritime law enforcement and legal frameworks are strengthened and then move into new areas where they have identified a gap or a loophole. I would like to refer to a study we did in partnership with the University of Copenhagen and their Center for Military Studies back in 2018 but the findings are still valid and where they state that beyond individual forms of crime, we have to look at the broader crime complex at sea, which is characterized by interconnectivity between different types of crime and dynamics, causing crime to reposition thematically into other types of criminal ventures and or to reposition geographically when pressures of deterrence are exerted. These dynamics are referred to as ballooning effects. By way of example, there's evidence that former piracy action groups moved into other types of crimes at the piracy business model came under pressure due to various measures of deterrence. The mutually reinforcing effect of naval patrols, industry self-protection and regional prosecutions 
render piracy a dangerous and non-profitable business. The advent of these circumstances roughly coincided with the then rapid destabilization of Yemen, which led to Tip and Sum becoming a more profitable and less risky business for former pirates. Having looked at the broader crime complex at sea, the main conclusion is that it's not useful to tackle individual types of maritime crime in isolation. In order to tackle the issue, it's not enough to only look at disruption at sea, but to rather take a comprehensive approach, which includes the root causes and the kingpins and organized crime element behind the crimes. This requires strengthened maritime security. Next. Before I conclude, I would like to just mention the value in a comprehensive response, which involves the full criminal justice system. This requires a whole of government approach where all rele relevant agencies cooperate and coordinate in handling maritime crime from sea to court. I thank you and I hand over to my fellow panelists who will reflect further on this. Thank you, over to you, Admiral. Thank you very much, Siri. You are very, very kind. Let me introduce now our second speaker. Dr. Joshua Talis, a political military analyst specializing in maritime security and Arctic strategy. As a research scientist at the Center of Naval Analysis, he focuses on helping uniformed and civilian leaders develop a strategy and policy informed by empirical analysis. When at CNA headquarters, Dr. Talis serves as a project director leading across the disciplinary teams, executing studies for commands across the Navy and the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Examples include three congressional mandates projects in 2020 and 2021 on Arctic and maritime security topics. When not at headquarters, he embeds with the fleet serving as a house in-house analytic advisor through CNA's field program. In 2018, he embarked the aircraft carrier, Harry S. Truman, working for the strike group commander. In 2021, Talis returned to the field to support the commander of US Sixth Fleet. He holds a PhD in international relations, is an adjunct professor at the George University, in George Washington University, and is the author of The, the War for Muddy Waters, pirates, terrorists, traffickers, and maritime insecurity. Dr. Joshua Talis, the audience is yours. Admiral, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Good morning to everybody uh, over in uh, North America and South America, and good evening or good afternoon to anybody uh, in, in my half of the world right now. Uh, I just wanted to reiterate at the top uh, that the comments here are uh, my own, don't reflect those of, of CNA, uh, or the Navy. Um, I'm here to talk uh, uh, today about a particular subsection of the issue of criminal activity in the maritime environment. And in particular, my uh, brief is intended to focus on uh, maritime crime uh, and placing that in the strategic, uh, larger strategic context. Uh, and then to pivot to address the question of uh, maritime crimes implications for, for navies. And the way I'm going to uh, frame that is first talking about maritime insecurity as a nexus issue. And in many ways, I'm going to build uh, on uh, Ms. Bune's comments about some of the interconnectivity between uh, maritime insecurity uh, uh, across the domain, uh, and then talk uh, from an implication standpoint uh, with respect to both operational risks, uh, but also some of the larger strategic challenges uh, that this issue brings up. So first talking about maritime crime uh, and insecurity in its larger strategic context. The maritime domain is fundamentally a multifunctional arena. And as a consequence, it's a space where security dynamics overlap with one another. When I give talks or write about uh, maritime insecurity, one of the things I like to harp on is that what brings all of these issues together is that they are all happening in the same substrata. They are all happening in the same domain. And that brings different types of insecurity into, uh, into contact with one another. And there, there we can sort of formulate or think about this in, in two different ways. The first is that the, the maritime arena is important for different strategic reasons to different kinds of, of actors, right? The sea is a resource. 
The C is a medium for transportation and trade. The C is an area of sovereign space where states uh, enforce their, their claims to territoriality. Um, and the C is a major component of the, of the environment, right? And as a consequence, the C faces different kinds of risks that can overlap with one another, right? So competition and pollution, terrorism, conflict, piracy, interstate conflict, uh, large scale criminal activity, pollution, exploitation, all of those interact with one another and in different ways in which the maritime space is, is important. And then another way of, of, of formulating that is to think about the different overlapping components of security, each of which has an element or interacts with the maritime domain, and where all of those come together is the concept of maritime security. So human security, which is a focus of, of our, our conference today, is one element of this, but we can see that there's clear overlaps between, for example, human security and environmental security, right? Degradation to, to uh, the, the, the um, maritime environment has a direct impact on uh, human security, food security, which then creates implications for national security and the blue economy. All of these are interrelated with one another, which means that whenever we're talking about issues of sufficient scale when it comes to maritime crime, we're inherently talking about issues that can bleed into what some might consider more strategic dimensions. So while maritime security uh, is, is multifunctional, maritime insecurity is also multifunctional, right? And again, it's important to, to highlight and, and discuss these cross functions because it helps explain, and this I think uh, reacts in some way to, to the excellent presentation uh, by Dr. Curtis before, uh, by Dr., uh, Dr. Bell before, talking about you know, why, why does this matter? Well, one of the reasons why, why maritime security matters and maritime crime matters in particular is because these things aren't happening in isolation with one another. So we see, and these are just some examples, connections between piracy and illegal unreported and unregulated fishing. Um, we know that there are strong, the International Labor Organization has done a lot of work documenting connections between IUU fishing and human trafficking and forced labor. In the Caribbean, we have documented cases of relationship uh, between gun running and drug smuggling. Those are mutually reinforcing networks. Um, we know, for example, about potential relationships between drug smuggling and terror financing. Uh, in the Gulf of Guinea, we know about relationships between illegal oil bunkering uh, and insurgency, right? So maritime crimes don't uh, exist uh, in isolation from one another. And as a consequence, they have the potential to ladder up into more strategic considerations. One uh, example building on uh, what Ms. Bune noted uh, is the relationship between piracy and terrorism. And there are, there are actually two ways that I think that we can usefully think about um, maritime crime using this as, a, as sort of a mini case study. The first is that piracy and terrorism can emerge from shared environmental conditions, which is to say that the same underlying conditions of insecurity can create multiple forms of maritime crime. Now, sometimes that means that these emerge in the same physical domain, and it can create the con or the appearance uh, that there is a deeper underlying relationship between the two that may not actually be there. Right, sort of the one of the holy grails for the for the study of, of piracy has been establishing clear connections between piracy and terrorism that aren't always actually there. But one of the reasons why analysts frequently look for that is because the conditions that create both of those types of insecurity are the same. And now another way of saying that is that when you have the conditions that are listed here on the left, things like you know, legal or jurisdictional opportunities or the promise of reward, inadequate security, you're not just going to get one type of maritime crime. You end up with a likelihood of multiple forms of maritime crime proliferating because they share those underlying, uh, those underlying drivers and factors. But another way of looking at this is that uh, some types of maritime crime are so large and so significant that they, they themselves create follow-on forms of insecurity. And again, piracy here um, is a good example. The, the execution of piracy can itself create other forms, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, the, the, the pursuit of uh, uh, maritime terrorism in this case um, can fall, can create other uh, implications and other forms of, of uh, maritime crime. And so I've, I've borrowed this taxonomy uh, from a stable seas report, which I think is, uh, does a really great job of laying this out. But you know, the most prominent example of maritime terrorism uh, is the actual attack at sea. But there are numerous ways that are more criminal than terroristic in nature that maritime terrorist groups um, may pursue their activities in the maritime uh, space 
So for example, they may engage in piracy in order to fund terrorism. Uh, they may engage in illicit trafficking in order to move people or goods or weapons or, or bulk cash in the pursuit uh, of their aims. They may engage in extortion rackets in order again for terror financing. So these are ways where some acts of, of maritime crime uh, can, can directly in and of themselves create other forms of maritime insecurity. A second way of, of thinking about this is in the concept of the ad hocracy, which is that maritime networks in particular are uh, very well suited for um, adaptation to other forms of, of criminal activity. And there are a number of spaces where we see this in action. So for example, uh, I mean, it's been uh, mentioned uh, the Mediterranean migrant crisis. And one, and this, this graphic is from a, a report from, from the RAND Corporation, which highlights that the networks that were engaged in forging documents and smuggling individuals uh, from the Mediterranean, across the Mediterranean into Southern Europe were often themselves also engaged in things like drug trafficking or, or small arms trafficking, right? So these groups create, to some extent, uh, their own self-reinforcing feedback loops as they diversify, because they are ultimately businesses that are seeking both to maximize profit and, frankly, to reduce risk. And in the same way you reduce risk in your retirement portfolio by diversifying your investments, criminal networks that are fundamentally selling the ability to move goods at sea typically diversify in the types of, of assets uh, and products that they sell. And so again, in the Caribbean, we see mixed trafficking networks. So organizations that may originally have been small scale and moving marijuana are co-opted occasionally to move cocaine. And then once you're capable of, of moving uh, narcotics at that scale, you're often then involved in uh, bulk cash smuggling, gun smuggling, and, and human trafficking. And in fact, we saw the reverse of this in the rise of uh, Mexican cartels as uh, leaders in, in the Caribbean drug trade. They have, many of them actually began not smuggling narcotics, but smuggling people across the US border, right? So, so these, these networks should be fundamentally understood as capable of moving anything, and they adapt in ad hoc ways as the opportunities present, present themselves. Again, similar examples uh, in the Gulf of Guinea um, and in the Gulf of Aden in the Western Indian Ocean. In terms of what that means for uh, sea services, well, uh, I mentioned at the top that we can break this down into both operational risks and, and strategic considerations. From an operational standpoint, groups that are capable of sustained and significant political violence in the maritime arena um, are not necessarily hugely common relevant, uh, relative to the scale of, of something like terrorism or insurgency more broadly, but they do arise globally, right? So you can see here that we've got examples from, from the Middle East uh, all the way uh, to the Indian Ocean uh, and the Pacific and Latin America. Now that means that those groups are often fairly sophisticated. Um, they're also fairly innovative um, and they, they present genuine threats to operating forces globally. Um, so we've seen examples uh, in two cases of uh, non-state groups uh, uh, leveraging technology allegedly provided from Iran, uh, shooting uh, um, uh, anti-ship cruise missiles um, at actual naval vessels, INS Hanit, the Israeli vessel in 2006, uh, and then again uh, in 2016. Now, critically, one, one reason I want to point this out, and I think this goes uh, to one of the points raised earlier about why are we, why are we so interested in, in this issue if there's pressing issues related to uh, great power competition at play. Well, to the best of my knowledge, the only time a, uh, a U.S. Navy vessel has ever employed uh, countermeasures like the evolved Sea Sparrow missile in self-defense in a real-world situation was when the USS Mason was fighting off a barrage of anti-ship cruise missiles uh, fired from the Houthis in the Gulf of Aden, right? So, so that's where a real sort of, you know, threat presents itself from a day-to-day -day level. And then there are other, other examples, um, Houthis innovating with unmanned attacks against uh, Saudi assets uh, in 2017, 2018. Um, and then from more of a criminal standpoint, some significant strides uh, in semi-submersibles. The top image you can see here was the interdiction of the first known semi-submersible to cross the Atlantic uh, and was interdicted off the coast of Spain. 
And then there are the strategic implications, right? So from a US standpoint, the question of how do we balance competition and maritime security, right? And part of that is the question of the relationship of day-to-day -day operations, which often do focus on low-end maritime and security issues to this broader idea that US strategy is now pivoted towards great powers. There's, there's a tension there that, that uh, the sea services are trying to resolve an advantage at sea, the latest tri-service maritime strategy is an example to that. And we can see some, some rising and falling in terms of the, the, the attention to maritime and security issues, right? So terrorism has started to fall from a focus area, but illegal fishing has started to rise. So there are these questions about what taxonomy and typology do we use in US strategy to think clearly about how these maritime and security and human security issues matter. And then from an alliance management and a partner management uh, priority, there are all sorts of ways of thinking about this. So there's a north-south divide for NATO, right? South, southern NATO countries are much more concerned about human security and maritime insecurity issues than perhaps their, their northern counterparts. The US faces this more, more broadly. And then we have these serious questions about what's the point of capacity building exercises, right? I mean, originally the idea from behind the US's engagement in capacity building was to enhance regional security, but it, more and more we hear that it really it's about countering uh, the efforts of, of China and Russia. And the US is gonna need to pick a narrative about what its intention is there. And this is my, my final slide, just a, a summary piece here is, is a reminder uh, about the pull of the present. And um, I think a lot of people uh, on this call are I'm kind of preaching to the choir about the significance of, of maritime security and maritime criminal issues to the larger strategic environment. But one message that I, I always try and impart on this is that it's not, the, the point here is not that non-state actors uh, change history on their own, right? Typically what we need to pay attention to is that it's state responses to non-state actors that really matter. And what I find most disconcerting um, is that often we're not thinking about maritime crime and the risk there uh, is that inevitably the US or its allies or partners will face a maritime criminal, criminal issue of such a scale that they'll need to respond and they won't have thought strategically about how to do so and what their equities are, right? And so part of this is an insurance policy against overreaction to an issue that is endemic and will exist uh, in perpetuity regardless of the status of stuff like great power competition. Uh, and with that, I will uh, yield the floor and I look forward to hearing the conversation. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Tal. It's very kind of you for your presentation, very complete and very informative. Next, I will introduce our final speaker. Lieutenant Commander Kellan Bourne joined the Trinidad and Tobago Coast Guard in 2002. And subsequently, she trained at the Britannia Royal Naval College, BRNC in Dartmouth, becoming the first female officer to have completed the Royal Navy Young Officers course. Additionally, she received the Admiralty Binoculars in 2005 for her outstanding performance at the BRNC. Kellan has served as number, in numerous Coast Guard vessels and has had two commands at sea. In her last command, Lieutenant Commander Bourne was the first female commanding officer on board the standard patrol class TTS Carly Bay, which made her maiden voyage from Holland to Trinidad and, to in and Tobago in December, 2016. She has also served as in many short assignments. Before joining the NSC class of 2022 at the US Naval War College last July, Lieutenant Commander Kellan Bourne was the Trinidad and Tobago Military Liaison Officer for the Joint Interagency Task Force South. Kellan holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Management Studies, First Class Honors, as well as a Master of Science in, Engin in Operational Maritime Management. Ladies and gentlemen, Lieutenant Commander Kell and Born. Good morning, sir. Thank you so much for the introductions. Uh, good morning, all. It is in my esteemed pleasure to be a member of this panel, and I look forward to our fruitful discourse after. I'll just wait a while till my presentation loads. And it has loaded. Next slide, please. This is my agenda today as outlined. Uh, my intent is to inform of all operations and concepts as well as policy and force options we as a Coast Guard are looking at and actively engaged in doing. Next slide, please. 
Tran Tobago is a twin island republic um, or territorial waters are measured at 12 nautical miles from the nearest point of our archipelagic baseline and or its specific economic zone extends to 200 nautical miles with deviations existing with our closest neighbors, Venezuela, Grenada, St. Vincent and Grenadines and Barbados. Next slide, please. We are also the Southern MRCC or Maritime Regional Coordinating Center for the Caribbean with 62,500 square nautical miles area of responsibility, which is shown by the area encompassed by the yellow hash lines. Next slide, please. The maritime concepts employed within our area responsibility include our coastal surveillance through our maritime radar, which provides 360 degree coverage around the island. This is also augmented by overflights via Trinidad and Tobago Air Guard. Sea control, in which the freedom of legitimate use of a maritime environment in specified areas for a specified period of time are limited. The use of maneuvering tactics to disrupt illicit activities by providing a consistent presence or conducting activities. Sea denial, which is again a limited form of sea control, and our economy of effort, where our areas of responsibility are divided into sectors for efficiency of operation. The Coast Guard will deploy its assets using strategies that increase flexibility and makes best use of our assets' organic capabilities. Routine patrols will continue to be employed. However, in the event of an additional requirement for increased coverage, even in multiple sectors, additional assets can be employed. In this way, the requisite effects can be brought to bear in a given situation through rapid and intelligent force generation. Next slide, please. Tran Tobago's strategic location acts as a transshipment point for the movement of illicit drugs, such as cocaine and marijuana, from South America to further up north the island chain and to Europe, or ecstasy and other designer drugs from Europe up the island trade, heading west towards the United States. One of our primary roles in, includes counter, counter drug operations, which are ably supported by our existing cadre of highly trained personnel, a robust fleet of assets that provides access and capability within the littoral to the offshore environment. This illicit trade has seen an evolution of go fast vessels transiting at high speeds to the slow moving fishing vessels mimicking our local traffic to avoid evasion, though the former is still existing today. Trans Tobago is being the most southerly Caribbean island, has created a niche for itself by providing a haven for the yachting community from hurricanes and other natural disasters, as well as providing cheap repairs. This has created opportunities for drug traffickers to utilize sailing vessels as part of their strategy. Other tactics employed include ship-to-ship -ship transfers outside our TTWs, falsifying vessel documents, disabling and dis uh, manipulating of EIS, movements of a large sum of US currency for exchange, the use of illegal arms and ammunition to protect the shipments, physically altering the vessel's identification, and as well as creating hidden compartment spaces. With the advent of the global COVID-19 pandemic, we've observed smaller shipments and the use of illegal migrants and decoy vessels to further conceal the shipments. Moreover, we have also witnessed the outsourcing of criminality where persons from Trinidad and Tobago are hired to transport drugs up the island by different drug trafficking organizations or DTOs, having limited knowledge of any other aspect of the business. Next slide, please. This slide shows our annual narcotic seizures from 2016 to 2020. What is very apparent is though the global pandemic may have slowed the DTO's operations, they have consistently remained flexible and resilient in their operations. Next slide, please. Strand Tobago is a signatory of the conservation, several conventions, including the International Con Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tunas, ICATS, and agreements such as the Agreement on Port State Measures to Prevent, Deter, and Eliminate Illegal, Unreported, and Unregulated Fishing, PSME. Our operations have observed this illicit trade by both foreign and local flag vessels conducting activities to include the involvement in the drug trade, unpermitted fishing within our EZ, unpermitted fishing of particular species on the high seas, where the vessel would have been granted permission from their flag state, but have either exceeded their quota or they are clearly targeting another species, which is not simply as a result of their bycatch. 
uh, switching off their AIS, especially for vessels more than 300 gross tons, which is a SOLAS requirement. And they've also delayed in reporting at valid port of calls. Trans-Adego Fisheries Division, and by extension, the Coast Guard, has continued to maintain key partnerships with key agencies, such as the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, the Joint Indian Agency Task Force South, CARICOM Impacts, and the Barbados Coast Guard. These partnerships are essential not only because of the connectivity of our oceans, but because IUU fishing provides a gateway to other illicit transnational crimes. Next slide, please. We have been dealing with human smuggling and trafficking for quite some time. However, with the downfall of the Venezuelan economy and the rise of the COVID-19 cases in our country, our border security patrols has drastically increased. The smugglers or traffickers have well-established routes and they have developed quite uh, distinct local networks, which has made eradicating this trade extremely difficult. This illicit trade has proven quite lucrative for the operators and it carries at least harsh penalties than the traditional drug trade. With the influx of these migrants, a detention center was established at our heliport base for these persons to be quarantined and then detained. From May 2020 to present, we have housed approximately 872 illegal migrants, with the youngest being a three-month-old baby. We remain thankful for ongoing support that we receive from our international partners, inclusive of the US, which have continued to assist in the upkeep of the center. Next slide, please. The insatiable demand for wildlife in Trinidad and Tobago has encouraged a thriving trade, trade between the Twin Island Republic and the neighboring island of Venezuela. But the crippling economic crisis in Venezuela, more of its citizens and the DTOs are lured to its profitable illegal trade for its minimal effort and quick turnover. The animals are smuggled over in pirogs from the South American country to Trinidad for sale either as pets or for local consumption at expensive or exotic dishes. The animals frequently trans trafficked into Trinidad includes parrot, macaw, monkeys, iguanas, just to name a few. One such in demand item is a bullfinch bird, which is a highly prized competitive bird singing, um, a highly prized bird singing um, skill. Locally, this bird costs thousands of dollars, but once it's trafficked from Venezuela, there's a starting cost of roughly 500 Trinidad legal dollars which is equivalent to 75 US dollars per bird by the dozen on the black market. Moreover, as the Venezuelan crisis unfolded, there has been an exacerbation of illicit smuggling of copper and brass. But this trend has lessened today with greater awareness of their possible origins. Next slide, please. We continue to highlight the gaps in our existing legislation, which allows criminals to evade capture and we work with our legislative arms of government to strengthen our legal instruments. The government has also devised a mechanism of strategic procurement that prioritizes critical spares for a fleet and minimizes downtime. But it is important to remember that no man is an island, nor does every country have the resources it requires to achieve its mission. Hence, there are plans afoot to further leverage the strengths of our existing regional and international partnerships through bilateral and multilateral initiatives with the Regional Security System, RSS, CARICOM Impacts, and JITAF South. We are also working on increasing our maritime domain awareness through digital transformation and effective use of technology, ISR capabilities, Intel sharing MOU, and hopefully a purchase for a helo or fixed wing capability. Next slide, please. DTOs evolve. Changing threats and the global COVID-19 pandemic dictates that we continuously be dynamic and rethink our existing strategies. We must enhance our civil military relationships with our local partners, which include the police, customs, immigration, maritime authority, fisheries, and the yachting association to improve our overall efficiency. With the criminal gangs having a greater presence in our local communities, we need to employ the use of information operations which shapes the battle space for all benefit. Our existing capabilities is limited, and this requires a more pointed approach in terms of how we deploy our A assets. Next slide, please. In closing, the Trinidad and Tobago Coast Guard remains committed to counteracting illicit activity within our areas of responsibility, which have an inundating effect on in our local communities, leading to increased socioeconomic challenges, increased crime, 
and instability. To reiterate the words of Thomas Jefferson, evil trumps when good men do nothing. Thank you very much for the pleasure of my, uh, my writing my brief. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, Lieutenant Commander Kellan Horn. Uh, thank you to all of the speakers for their very insightful presentation. At this point, I invite all the speakers to go camera and mic on for our question and answer period. For all participants in the, in the conference, if you have already done so, you can start posting your questions in the chat box now. So let's start, I have a question or, already for each one of you. So let me start with um, Ms. Biun. You have two questions. The first one is, in your last slide, in your last slide you were talking about criminal justice. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah, thank you very much. And I didn't have a chance to elaborate much on, on the need for a criminal justice response. And I know that the main topic here today uh, goes um, focuses on the maritime law enforcement response. But from the GMCP's perspective, uh, we would want to see a legal finish to the crimes we're tackling. So in doing so, it's a key that all the criminal justice chains are, are uh, properly enforced and, and the way. So in that regard, we're talking about the specific maritime law enforcement response at sea, and that that's properly done and then handed over to the land response, which often goes to police, investigators, and prosecutors. Um, this uh, requires proper evidence collection at sea, ensuring that the evidence collected is admissible in court, working closely with prosecutors in that regard. One focus we have is to train uh, law enforcement and prosecutors together so prosecutors can tell maritime law enforcement what they are they need in order to have a, pro a good case in court. Um, that also looks at the proper handover uh, from, from sea to land and uh, thorough pro court proceedings as well as we include the prison uh, component in ensuring uh, human rights compliant prison conditions. These all require a proper cross-agency coordination, as well as proper uh, maritime security strategies and good uh, maritime domain awareness in order to reach to that overall target of a legal finish to, uh, to the crimes we're looking at, uh, as well as a regional cooperation. Because it, one thing is to have the cross-agency at the national level cooperation, but it's also key that the coordination and cooperation and sharing of information between regional states, because we're talking about transnational organized crime, uh, that that's also uh, included. I think that uh, response. Okay. Thank you. I'm probably going a little bit more into the actual uh, practical application. Would you elaborate a little bit more on the um, maritime security cooperation between land focus and land organized multilateral institutions like the African Union, Asian, et cetera, that they should, usually they don't work together. What could be the strategies of the United Nations to make them to work more closely together? So all our programming in most regions fall under uh, existing uh, maritime uh, security frameworks that's established by regional organizations. Taking the example of African Union, we make sure to uh, support the AIMS 2050, as well as implementation of the Loma Charter. So we reached out to African Union in that regard. But I would like to use the example of uh, working in the Gulf of Guinea, where we have existing maritime uh, strategies under ECOWAS and ECAS, and in support of the ICC, we ensure that reach coastal states uh, or regional states, broader, uh, as well as land of, uh, work together in implementing these strategies and in support of the existing framework and reach, uh, working with regional uh, organizations. The same applies for Southeast Asia and falling under, like all programming falls under the, the existing framework of ASEAN as used as an example. Here. So. Thank you very much. Uh, this is question is for uh, Dr. Talis. The US combatant commands are organized around land masses. And this means maritime human security problems are occurring <clears throat> on the <clears throat> geographical margins. For example, the Mediterranean smuggling map show areas uh, that are concerning to Africom, CENTCOM, and EUCOM. 
how are these commands cooperating around maritime issues? Are they doing enough? How could they do better? Yeah, Emeril, uh, thank, thank you for the question. And uh, uh, thank you to, uh, to, to Curtis for that one as well. It's, uh, it's problematic, right? I, I think the observation is correct. Um, not only that the, 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 the US's geographic combatant commands um, are not built around uh, the maritime domain, they're also explicitly built around um, really state-based threats, right? I mean, uh, but the, the less mature of the U.S.'s geographic-based combatant commands, um, the youngest of which is U.S. AFRICOM, I think underscores the fact that, that historically these, these commands were, were built with an eye towards um, uh, state-based threats originally the Soviet Union and now um, uh, principally geared towards, towards China and Russia. Um, now, maybe, you know, sort of Two ways to answer that question. The first is that to some extent, um, there are ways around this that are also related to the maritime domain's inherent flexibility, right? And so one answer to that is that U.S. Navy fleets um, don't necessarily only line up with the geographic combatant command lines. So um, where I'm sitting now in, in, in Naples is the headquarters of, of the U.S. Sixth Fleet, um, which extends between both the European theater's waters and most of the African theater's waters. Now, that doesn't totally solve the problem because uh, fleets are operational arms. Um, and staff will still answer to two different bosses when it comes to either Africa Command or, or uh, European Command. Um, but you know, in theory, at least the 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 fleet level provides an opportunity for the U.S. Navy um, to be a little bit more dynamic in the way it thinks about geography as compared to um, those living at the geographic combatant command level. Um, and then the second point I'd make there is that it doesn't have to be this way. Um, there's an excellent new book out uh, by my colleague Steve Wills called Strategy Shelved, which chronicles the 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 rise uh, among other things of the modern modern version of the geographic uh, combatant commands and the loss of the US Navy's uh, sort of historic viewpoint of looking at the sea as a broader maneuver space. Um, uh, but that's a relatively modern transition, right? This is this is this has happened sort of late Cold War in, into the modern into the modern moment. Uh, and there's a lot of agitation, uh, I think, happening right now, thinking about whether or not the, the UCP, the Unified Command Plan lines, um, really harness the, the sort of the inherent flexibility and capability of, of the U.S. Navy. So, you know, other ways to sort of take the question, but in, you know, it, was, it was offered from an organizational format. And so I'd say that, you know, yeah, there, there should be some more creativity thought about whether or not the current structure that the U.S. employs um, fully leverages the flexibility and the maneuverability of the U.S. Navy. Thank you very much, Dr. Talis. I have one for uh, Commander, Lieutenant Commander Bourne. Do you have interdiction authorities over foreign vessels outside your territorial waters? If so, what are your processes? Thank you very much, Admiral. Um, our ability to intersect outside our TPWs are limited uh, in that we do not have any existing bilateral agreements with island states to facilitate boarding and interdiction of their flags. However, what we do have is an excellent relationship with our partners and our counterparts in the neighboring Caribbean islands and their, their equivalents in the diplomatic channels, which facilitates a quick response to our dynamic environment. Um, moreover, if more time permits and we have a more targeted intelligence-driven operations, we would tend to embark a U.S. Costa Ledet team on board our assets, which has frequently happened in the past, as they not only bring their communication suite and their access to U.S. intelligence, but also a host of legal support, given that they have a number of bilateral agreements with a number of our neighboring um, islands. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you so much. This is for everyone. The transshipment of materials and equipment subject to sanctions on the high seas and territorial seas has been used to avoid sanctions. What would be an effective way to avoid it? Who would like to jump first? Siri. I can use uh, some of the experience and examples we have in supporting member states in trying to uh, disrupt um, 
trade that uh, falls under sanction regimes. And we see some challenges with regard to actual uh, work on the enforcement side. Um, what one key area is that these resolutions need to be very detailed and, and uh, clear on what the different actors are looking at. And we want to see it from different angles. So it's key to work with both, which we talk about commodities that are in principle legal, but then turning into illegal commodity because it falls under sanction regimes. Then uh, what are the patterns and trends and having the research and studies uh, as part of awareness raising. And then what exactly are they looking at? So it's very concrete what we expect of law enforcement, uh, border control agencies, as well as exporters, importers, uh, and the shipping uh, industry as well as, as flag uh, states. And, and one other component that's important there is uh, the use of vessel registries and how awareness raising and sharing of information can be done between the partners and alerting certain ships that's been involved in uh, sanction uh, breach, how uh, different flag states can then inform uh, other flag states uh, of, of these uh, infringements. So those are some of the ideas in order to uh, strengthen the sanction regimes. Thank you very much. Anyone else? So I would just like to add uh, from the enforcement side, I think uh, these issues are always going to come up because the high seas is that, that gray area where nobody really has an authority unless you're the flag state or aligned with that particular ship. So for something like that to have a much, a we to be able to have an effect on that kind of illicit trade, we need to be able to start from a partnership standpoint uh, within the region. Um, it cannot happen with all partnership, uh, not just, with the, not just uh, with, between militaries, but also civil military in terms of the respective maritime administrations, as Siri yes. would have mentioned, that is critical. We need to be able to partner with these um, organizations so that they have an understanding, not that, uh, that this space is being utilized for illicit activity. Um, and only through that, I think we can be able to overcome some or reduce some of these, these threats. Thank you very much. I have another question for the three of you. Um, we can see clearly the intersection between insecurity and crime at sea, and how this is affecting the life and security of many people around the world in coastal areas and even inside the countries. Because, as uh, Dr. Talis was mentioning, things start at sea. I mean, they start in land, they go to sea, and then they finish at, again in land. Why navies are so reluctant to talk about this? Because they see these kind of matters as distraction to their mission. I can give that a shot first. Okay. Um, well, I, I would say, you know, it's, it's some navies, right? I mean, ma many, many navies and many Coast Guards, and this gets into a separate discussion about the actual structure, composition, and authorities of various navies and Coast Guards. Many countries' navies are really Coast Guard, you know, so there are some, there are some fine grained distinctions there. Many of them are focused on these maritime criminal issues because they are fundamentally existential to to, to you know, the, either national sovereignty or national economies, right? Many, many countries, either coastal or small island developing states or archipelagic nations fundamentally rely on the blue economy or tourism uh, that's also related to the blue economy um, that maritime criminal activities really fundamentally threaten. So there's a separate category, I think the questioner is getting to of larger navies that, that don't particularly see this. And I think some of it is because there is a first order obligation to, uh, to defend national sovereignty um, and the larger uh, your country or the larger your navy, the larger the possibility that one of your existential threats is actual major great power conflict, right? So there's, there is a first order obligation in order to, to, to be prepared for those contingencies. But I think a lot of it comes down to, to the national myth, right? I mean, in the United States, um, the, the, the Navy has historically talked about its legacy with respect to um, uh, major conflict, despite the fact that the U.S. Navy has an, an equally storied legacy with respect to countering maritime crime. Um, there's an excellent book by a, a, a Naval Academy professor, uh, B.J. Armstrong, called Small Boats and Daring Men, 
uh, maritime raiding, irregular warfare, and the early American Navy, where he, he talks about this history. Um, but it's just, it's not a part of the, the story that the U.S. Navy tells about itself. So some of this is really just, you know, uh, doing a better job teaching, you know, our, our incoming uh, cadets and midshipmen the history of, of their own naval forces um, and the significance of these maritime criminal issues to the very foundation of, of why they exist. Well, what a nice, great participation and, and the answering of your the question has been fantastic. Uh, unfortunately, we ran out of time. So we have to go back to Andrea. Thank you so much, Commander Cameron. You have been very kind. We had a lot of answers still going there. I can see in the faces of the participants, but the time was running out. Thank you so much to the panel. It has been wonderful. I have been already working with you today. Thank you so much. Thank you to Admiral Guillermo Barrera, Siri Bjun, Josh Tallis, and Kel Ann Bourne. This was a wonderful panel about criminal activities in the maritime environment and what navies and coast guards are doing. Most impressive was how our speakers are connecting their themes, particularly to more traditionally viewed security issues and to broader competition. As we go into our second break, please join us again at 1120 as we start our third panel of the day with Commander Michelle Shallop on illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. Thank you for joining us.